On this week's story of wartime reflections around Glastry, we are going to hear of the Hammond family, how they came down and settled in Ballyhemlin, and then wartime arrived and they had to vacate their farm and were relocated to Red Bay Farm in Glastry. So this is the story, it's told by Cyril Cavan, my cousin, whose grandfather and my grandfather are the same man, Matthew Hammond. So we're going to hear about that story. In the background here you can see the gun range. The planes were brought up to the gun range and set up either 100 or 200 yards or 300 yards off it and the gun sites were all set up. Uh, originally we can see the rock inside the, and stone inside the, the brick frame there but that was filled as it, with sand, it was like a big sand pit and then that stopped the bullets from ricocheting. Sometimes when we listen to the radio, particularly the news, uh, the newsreaders start off with news headlines. And maybe today I was thinking of starting off with the history headlines. Uh, and when I say that, I mean the history of the Hammond family. And so that involves Liss Minton, Bally Hemlin, uh, the outbreak of war, the three runways, the New Zealand connection, the demolition, and then finally Jimmy the horse. So if we start off at Lisminton, now Lisminton, my maternal or our maternal uh, grandparents had a little farm down on the outskirts of Ballantra, and uh, unfortunately the land there was a bit on the poor side. Now a friend of Matthew's, Matthew and uh, Ethel Hammond, that's that, that's my. Uh, my uh, maternal grandparents. Um, a friend of uh, Matthew's would come across from Bangor and regale him about the wonderful agricultural land that there was in North Down, uh, which is just up the road from here. So then there's a gap to 1934-35 and Matthew and Ethel, they sold their farm down there and they auctioned all the goods and they moved up here to Ballyhemlin on the north side of Ballyhalbert. Now, as they were coming up, uh, as they were coming up from Donegal, the family actually came in a taxi. They had left everything else, sold everything else, and uh, in that taxi was my grandmother uh, and her five uh, children. That's Mabel, Maud, Violet, George, and John. Now, and unfortunately, the two oldest children, Olive and Ethel, had died in the flu pandemic in 1918, and they are buried down at Drum Home uh, Graveyard down outside Ballantra. But anyway, back in the taxi, oh yes, and by the way, Matthew, he had come ahead a couple of weeks ahead to sort out the farming part of things. So they're in the taxi and they're heading up, and this is a 19... Uh, 35 taxi now. <laughs> so they're heading up and they're going along minding their own business and suddenly a car shoots out from a side road and bumps into them. Now there was no great damage done but uh, in questioning the driver of the other vehicle saying why did he drive out onto a main road and his answer was there's never much traffic on the main road so I just drove out as normal. Anyway back in the taxi heading off and they stopped off in Newtonards to buy some essentials and when I say essentials I mean the kettle, the teapot, the saucepans, the frying pan, those sorts of things and they headed on down here and there was a great reunion when the family were together again down in this new house and the new farm at Ballyhalbert. Unfortunately there was an outbreak of war in 1939 and the government obviously had to move very fast indeed. Uh, Northern Ireland was not well off with uh, aerodromes and uh, so they decided that Bally Halbert area would make a good area for, uh, for the aerodrome. It's good flat land here and uh, unfortunately uh, my grandfather's farm uh, 
at Ballyhemlin was right plump in the middle of this. So anyway, they, uh, the government vested the farm and uh, then headed off uh, and started to think about the construction here. And the aerodrome here really consisted of three runways. There was a very long runway, uh, 600 feet, uh, sorry, 6,000 feet runway, and that was the one for the cargo um, aircraft coming in. And indeed, that's the same runway that General Eisenhower landed on uh, uh, coming up to the D-Day invasions. Uh, he stopped off here. Uh, he drove up to Bangor uh, to inspect the United States troops that were stationed in around there, and more importantly, out then and sailed through uh, quite a number of major American ships, Navy ships, that were anchored in, in uh, Belfast Loch. So that was the main runway, the, the 6,000 uh, feet one. There was two other smaller runways, 3,000 feet, uh, and one just ran north-south, north as it were. And the third one was the one that ran southeast, northwest. And that's the one, the end of that one was exactly where my grandfather's farm was. So uh, that was the situation there. And they were going to have to move out. They were compensated. They moved up to Red Bay on the other side of uh, Ballyhelbert here. But the issue, the issue seemed to be that uh, I needed a bit more information. So I needed to make a New Zealand contact. I should have said to you that my grandfather's oldest son, George, uh, once he left school he went off to college and he uh, studied at, uh, at a college in England and one here and then became a Methodist minister and the first thing was an 11-year posting in Jamaica as a missionary. And around about the time that Jamaica became independent, they moved back here and they spent some six years in uh, White Abbey. Uh, and then they decided, lock, stock and barrel, to head out to New Zealand. Uh, and off, off they went to New Zealand where uh, my Uncle George then uh, worked the rest of his life then as a, a Methodist minister and unfortunately died just a few years back there. But I asked him, now what's this about the demolition of the house? And he said, well, you have to remember, work was going on really, it was really going on all around this place here. There was contractors and lorries and implements and cement mixers. And at the same time, the uh, RAF were bedding in. They were bringing in personnel and, and uh, all their equipment. Uh, so. George was saying that uh, came the day they had decided that they were going actually to demolish their dwelling house and outhouses uh, by explosive. But uh, it was decided it was going to be a Sunday morning and uh, the good people of Ballyhalbert, now being very, what would you say, eco-friendly and uh, into recycling, they come up the previous evening, the Saturday evening, and uh, took the doors, front door and all, the windows, I think maybe the fireplace, the slates and the timber, really only leaving bricks and stones there for the big explosion the next day. And of course that suited the contractors down to the ground. They didn't want to have to pick through the rubble uh, to, to take out the timber and these other things. So that, uh, that sorted that out. and. Uh, but then you have to think about the fields. Now, Granda would have had crops growing in the fields, and one of the fields was right at the end of the runway, and it's important to remember that, right at the end of the runway, and it was a hay field. And uh, so one nice sunny uh, morning, uh, Matthew went out and he harnessed uh, Jimmy the horse up to the hay rake, and off he set from Red Bay Farm down to Ballyhemlin Farm, uh, and George came along with him. Now, once they arrived on site, 
uh, Matthew then indicated to George this was how it was to be done. And he took a couple of runs across the field with Jimmy, <laughs> with Jimmy and the hay rake to show him when to raise the tines and leave out the heap of, of hay behind, ready for ricking. So that was fine. After the couple of runs, my grandfather then stepped down from the hay rake uh, because the seat on these things were, were sitting up quite high and uh, got George ensconced and off he went to continue with the hay raking. Now all was going fairly well uh, and there was obviously the noise of great construction works going on right, left and centre and quite a hullabaloo down at the other end of the runway. And uh, as I say, good progress was being made. Uh, there was Jimmy the horse with his blinkers on. I should have said, yes, Jimmy the horse had his blinkers on. So all he could see was the little bit in front of him. So, and there was Jimmy plodding across this uh, hay field, doing a grand job. And uh, George, up on the top of the hay rake, thought to himself, that noise seems to be increasing. Indeed, there's a powerful noise. And he looked round to his right, down the runway, only to see a squadron, that's six planes, six hurricane planes, taking off in his direction. And they skimmed over the top of his head by maybe 20 feet or so with a huge amount of noise. Now, Jimmy, <laughs> and there's a plane now at the minute. So Jimmy the horse was not impressed. He was not amused. He was terrified and he took off and headed straight for the hedge. Now, when I heard my Uncle George telling me this, I said, now, and, and what happened next? What happened next? He says, Jimmy went straight through the hedge, but the rake, the hay rake, being a big, sturdy thing, it got stuck in the middle of the hedge with Jimmy well harnessed and dangling on the other side of the hedge. And it leaves me with two thoughts. Number one, I should have said earlier on, that the early warning system consisting of a pool with a five gallon yellow drum on the top of it warned the contractors and the airmen that there were farmers working in the field and they had that in place but obviously it didn't work and the second question is i wonder would there have been an inquiry